Hello, everyone. My name is Zubin Austin, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Center for Practice Excellence Speaker Series. I'd like to turn it over now to Annalise, the administrator for the Center for Practice Excellence, to introduce our speakers and our topic for today. Annalise. Thanks, Zubin. Um, so for those of us joining, for those of you joining today, our event will have a little bit of a different structure than usual. Um, so our topic is on minor ailment prescribing in Ontario, and we'll begin with a short presentation followed by panel remarks, and then wrap up with a question and answer period. Um, feel free to type your questions into the Zoom chat box uh, at any time during the presentations, and then we'll get to them during that section. So to get us started, um, our presenter starting us off today is Jeff Taylor from the University of Saskatchewan. Jeff is a Canadian pharmacist and academic with an interest in OTCs and minor ailments at the community pharmacy level. Jeff has 30 years of experience teaching about minor ailments and his research has focused on numerous aspects of how the public interacts with pharmacists about minor ailments. He's also evaluated the Saskatchewan Minor Ailments Program for its economic value and assorted clinical outcomes. So without further ado, please welcome me in joining Jeff and you can take it away. Okay, thanks Annalise. Uh, and thanks everyone for being here. I recognize some of the names, but uh, not all. Uh, I don't have to convince anyone of, of this. I could show a lot of numbers, but I just wanted to quickly just mention a, a story that my family doctor told me when he was a, a medical resident. They had a whole bunch of first year medical residents in the front row of Grand Rounds. And they said, oh yeah, we want uh, more information on that new rare disease. And the old guards at the back said, ah, not so much. We'd rather have information on coughs and diarrhea, things that we were actually going to see out there. So just for me to sort of put the perspective of common ailments, and we all know that uh, they're pretty important. Just a quick thought on, uh, is that the best term? I have never felt this, that somehow minor ailments is a bad term or it's derogatory, it doesn't convey the, the right tone. Uh, I'm fine with the term. I've done it for 30 years. I, I'm proud to do them. So uh, again, just for perspective, I don't spend a whole lot of time worrying about what's a, a better term. But if a better term came around, I would definitely use it. This has been around, uh, or sorry, uh, minor ailments and prescribing. Uh, we have this in the Canadian landscape, as uh, you all know. Just for a bit of background and how things can just, where do they come from? This goes back to 1988 in, in Florida was the, one of the first prescribing laws. And so lots of, lots of history. Now that flopped miserably. Uh, hopefully our, ours won't in, in Canada. Just gonna mention that's a couple things, uh, four issues, and then get into some aspects of what would it take for a launch? Okay, uh, first off, a bit of confessional. Uh, I've managed to straddle, I think, each of these and not touch on any of them, so that maybe about 10%, so a couple of little toes in each one. So not an expert on anything. Uh, so I, I feel kind of bad there, but again, I've, I've seen enough of these things uh, in different areas that I'll, I'll try to give you my perspective, but Lord knows I'm not an expert on, on any of this. I'm, I'm right dead in the middle. And uh, also of note, I have not been in the pharmacy since March 1st. I remember leaving the pharmacy, seeing people uh, cleaning us out of alcohol and toilet paper. And I haven't been in since because of COVID. So I've lost a lot of my, my active skills. And just for perspective, in that same time since March 1st, I've given myself uh, six haircuts just by looking in and the mirror in the back spurt on that than I am of uh, minor ailments of, of late. Do government wants, want this? I think that's obviously the answer depending on which part of the country you're in. I know that when no, New Brunswick launched theirs, the Minister of Health was very pragmatic about things and he said that it makes a lot of sense. Uh, alleviates a lot of the pressure on doctors, but that will uh, differ across uh, the, the, the nation, of course. What do physicians think about pharmacists prescribing? 
I would say that sums it up. No thanks. This was a relaunch of that thinking in 2018 in our, our province. They had a big promotion as far as um, social media and uh, other sites to say it's a good thing to talk to doctors about uh, this kind of stuff. Now they didn't slag pharmacists at all, but they're just sort of suggesting that uh, continuity, continuity of care is very important and to have doctors in that, that role as opposed to others that, uh, that people may have options to. So I would say that's the uh, prevailing thought, at least in Saskatchewan. I took it upon myself to, to check into the doctor mindset a couple of years ago. I had about 300 doctors give me some feedback. This was the main feedback that I got. Most ill-advised project, nothing but near disasters uh, with pharmacists prescribing so far in the province. Now to be fair, a uh, full spectrum was seen. And I put that little bit in the bottom there uh, in the right font because we didn't get a whole lot of that kind of feedback. It was mainly uh, physicians were not happy whatsoever. A lot of the UK want pharmacists to take this on, to take the pressure off of their doctors, not maybe because they're salaried, but I asked our physicians in, in this province, are you frustrated with minor ailment workload? And the vast majority you can see here said, no, we're, we're not. So that didn't appear to be an issue. They uh, embraced uh, that role. Now, something surprised me in the uh, feedback that I got, not so much the bottom line, uh, these minor ailments can be very easy to diagnose, but we can miss stuff. Of course, we, we all know that uh, before we even started. But the one above just shocked the hell out of me. Uh, the physician saying they had no idea that pharmacists had any clinical training whatsoever on dermatology or what have you. So that really surprised me as far as the perspective of doctors and what pharmacists may have as far as in their back pocket for, for training. Other things that came through, uh, they were quite mad that their own college really frowns upon the idea of physicians being connected to pharmacies and all the ethical issues that that's connected there. So they were quite adamant that pharmacists shouldn't do it if they're gonna uh, prescribe and dispense at the same time. Also, that would pharmacists jump to the prescribable agent to get, in our, in our case, $18, as opposed to getting the 33 or 40% markup by going to the first OTC products that all our standards recommend that we should consider first. So there are uh, strong pushback on ethics. And this, it was just more than professional. It just seemed to hit a real gut-wrenching uh, vein for, for doctors. They are not happy with the idea that pharmacists may be involved in uh, diagnosis. Came across this, uh, might've been OPA, I'm not sure, but. Uh, 70% of the respondents at this po point in the survey felt that we as pharmacists were doing diagnosis when we're involved in minor ailments. I'm not sure if I see a whole lot of it being pushed in Canada in formal measures, but in the UK and in other parts of, let's say, Australia and New Zealand, they really want to push society into uh, not seeing their doctor as much for these minor ailments. So that's a prevailing thought in lots of countries and implied in Canada. I asked physicians in the feedback, uh, should pharmacists be the first port of call for minor ailments? And about 40 or 50 doctors uh, applied to each of the first five categories. So strongly disagree to somewhat undecided and somewhat agree. So get a feel there for, uh, do they think we're a good uh, choice for the public to stop in first? The, uh, pharmacist feedback, I wasn't so much concerned about this as opposed to the doctor feedback and, and patient, but we'll just take a, a quick stop right here. I had about 300 uh, res uh, respondents here as well. And I got lots of feedback, but a lot of my angling was just to figure out uh, information that I could show doctors that we approach this situation very seriously. That it's not a money grab uh, uh, by any stretch. Uh, this is an important role in, in our history and we wanna do a good job. So I asked uh, pharmacists, just give me a feel for what's your referral rate for some of the conditions that we have on prescribing. 
And here we see 25 pharmacists say they never refer uh, a case of hemorrhoids, just in general speak. And about 100%, th oh, sorry, at the time, three said they refer all the time. And to get the whole picture in between there, I think this is important just to get a feel for uh, what's our comfort level for dealing with some of these uh, conditions. Cold sores, not much angst right here. The vast majority of pharmacists uh, deal with them and they don't do a whole lot of referral to a doctor. And migraine and dysmenorrhea kind of goes all over the map as you could imagine for those conditions. Again, trying to garner some information to feedback to doctors and how we approach these conditions because there was a lot of force against us to, to uh, running these programs. And I've got some public feedback as other people across the country do. Uh, access to physicians really rears its head in this area. So I'll just show you some uh, slides uh, for you here. Now, I do a lot of pharmacy practice research and I worry that what we ask busy pharmacists to do stuff like this. And I just cringe that we, uh, when they do get asked because they got enough things to do. Well, this was the easiest practice research study in the world bar none, they just did exactly what they would normally do. And if it happened to be a minor ailment prescribed, just give this four by six card to the customer and we did everything else after that. So really easy, probably thousands of prescribes done in the time we did this study and we just got very little feedback at all. So I felt quite let down, but I sort of know what it is. Uh, rest assured, this was a very easy study to do. I'll give you some feedback on on what we saw. Okay, again, worrying about doctors and what they think. Does the, the public feel confident in knowing when to see a doctor for the situation they had? And about 75% said very or 100% sure that they went to a pharmacist because they felt it was a good choice. They know when it, it's time to go see a doctor. That's good feedback to know. Not that they're right all the time, but that was their perceptions. So I double checked that a couple of years later and asked a bunch of uh, the public in Saskatchewan for various situations like a UTI or a cold sore, how soon would you see a doctor? Like right away, two weeks, four weeks, et cetera. And for the most part, this came across like the public knew what they were doing with minor ailments, be it prescribing or whatever. So that to me suggests that we seem to be on reasonably good footing as far as how the public chooses and us being one of the options for them. Why us rather than an MD? So we got some things in red here. Doctor's office was closed, uh, couldn't get an appointment, had to wait, no family doctor. I was worried about this one. That's only 2%. Now our numbers are very low, so it doesn't tell a whole lot. That number may be double digits uh, in, in, in our province. And I think it's important to know that the MD was the first choice in this one and maybe even this 18% right here. So we have to keep that in mind that they're coming to us, but they had thought about a doctor uh, beforehand for whatever their ailment was. How are we doing? Did the symptoms improve? Almost invariably, yes. So that was good feedback. And I didn't double check that in any kind of clinical uh, measures, but we just got the feedback and, and at, at a certain time, uh, after they, they saw the pharmacist. Like it, I didn't do it six months later to double check. If you had not asked for help, what would you have done? And we've got 33% MD, 3% uh, go to the ER. And as far as helping government understand the ramifications here, I made a point of isolating this case. So a cold sore lasted one day, this person would have gone to the ER. And so what's the cost of that encounter in the ER as opposed to uh, taking much cheaper means and probably equally effective, I would think you'd all agree. After getting help, did you go seek an MD? And the vast majority, no. And one of these people in the 3% already had an appointment booked. She just decided to keep it and go from there. So not a whole lot of reconsults for the, for the most part. Evaluation of the encounter, uh, lots of stuff here. Did the Pharmacists say good words, spend enough time with me. I thought I could focus on this. A doctor might have or would have been more thorough. Most people strongly or disagreed on that front. So that to me was an important uh, bit of feedback. They felt the doctor would not have been more thorough than uh, talking to the pharmacist. 
So it wasn't all rosy as far as the feedback. Uh, this is just one example. A 43-year-old uh, woman with acne, I think it was, clearly should have been referred to a doctor. We engaged in pharmacists prescribing there. That would not have been a good move in the case that we saw. So as far as talking to a whole bunch of people, healthcare providers and wherever, trust in the pharmacist was high. Convenience and access to care was critical in this process as far as how they valued it and why they, they chose it. Did it save the system money? Well, we've done economic evaluations later. I won't get into that kind of stuff, but just on a very uh, ground level here, 36% would have sought a doctor if no pharmacist and only 3% went on to see an MD. So it's lining towards the idea that this seemed to uh, bode well for saving money and having reasonable care. Some numbers for you, uh, 2018, about just shy of 17,000 prescribes in our province. And cold sores are the low hanging fruit here. They are bigger in numbers than the next three combined, uh, allergies, UTI, and BCP startups. So cold sores still maintain a, on the high shelf as far as uh, frequency goes. So implementation, just thoughts. And again, uh, we don't have the right person in front of you like me to go through the nuts and bolts of this, but just some thoughts. I think we can say we're doing a pretty good job uh, in Saskatchewan. Uh, Nova Scotia has a bit of a feedback across the world. Uh, same thing, this is, uh, uh, work for a person I know in, in the UK, symptom resolution is reasonably high and reconsultation re rates, sorry, are pretty low. So that bodes well. There are some uh, economic impact studies uh, done across the world and they seem to be aligning to this makes sense, although we could use some more info. Does this reduce MD visits? Something that uh, doc, uh, governments will want to know. Here's the Nova Scotia chart. So what would you have done if they had no access to the service? Family doc right here, and here's walk-in clinic and emergency room. So just the biggest part of the pie would have been official medical care. And we saw similar stuff in Saskatchewan. This is one thing I, I've, I've often thought as far as why would doctors be mad about this kind of thing? I, I get it, but could we not uh, shrink the treatment gaps? Like for something like conjunctivitis, a lot of people just tough it out and don't seek, seek medical care. So being more accessible, I would think that this would bode well for the system. And same for allergies. A report said about uh, only 60% of people sought out medical care in, in the timeline here. So otherwise they just sort of tough it out and suffer quality of life. We can do a pretty decent job of getting people started on medicines that they perhaps wouldn't have thought of otherwise, not seeing a doctor and then the patient gets filtered back into the medical system somewhere along the way, uh, I would think. Okay, physicians surely think that we are being aggressive. Birth control pills, uh, UTIs, I get that. But an important feedback that I got from pharmacists and doctors was these were, were these next two slides. I asked physician, uh, sorry, uh, pharmacists, of the 17 conditions that we do right now, which ones give you the most concern clinically? So here's the feedback. Dysmenorrhea, GERD, migraines, et cetera, et cetera. Infotego even made the list as far as being pretty high. That's what pharmacists had the most concern regarding what they're allowed to prescribe for. There's the same list for physicians. I asked them the exact same question. What are you worried about with pharmacists being involved in this care? And almost the exact same uh, feel here for the side, the, the, the slides. So my message to physicians were, you have concerns. Pharmacists also take this seri seriously and we have the same concerns as far as these conditions to make sure we do the correct thing. So I just found that quite striking as far as the lines being similar across both those groups. And I asked them ag again later, again, trying to build up a repertoire of information that physicians may somehow miraculously jump onto our side of thinking. I asked, uh, physicians, when do you want to see patients for various symptoms? And I asked pharmacists, when would you refer those same patients to doctors? And the numbers were strikingly similar. For diarrhea in a kid, 96% of pharmacists, 90% right away or within a couple of days. That was very similar to what docs say they wanted to see the patient and also the same lines that pharmacists would refer 
those patients uh, to the doctor. So implement, implementation thoughts, just to get the discussion going, I'd be, I mean, more than fascinated to hear what other people think. You get to benefit, benefit good or bad, for the track record of other provinces. For one of the rare times in your, probably your history, you're following some other places where Ontario usually leads the charge on so many things as far as our practice goes. All the proof that we have, and there's lots in the, uh, the world, less so in Canada, is likely still in, uh, insufficient to convince doctors of the value. But it's still important to shore up any uh, arguments that governments will have. So I don't think you could do 10 more studies. I doubt it's gonna convince many more doctors that, oh, now we get it. The secret shopper feedback is the state of the art as far as finding proof for how good we're doing. But it also has poor palatability in pharmacists. I tried to launch this in my own province and there was just no buy-in at the uh, organizational level to give that a try. We moved in stages. We started with three, then 10 and 17, whatever the numbers are. And now we got some pretty heavy ones with DCPs and, and UTIs. So we went in phases just via how things went. You may be able to jump right into the deep end and just, okay, all 20 that you love, do it. But going in two phases might garner some goodwill. Cut your teeth on the first 10, maybe the easier ones, and then go into more complex ones, just a thought. Consumer acceptance is evident, I think, in Canada. Consumer demand, a little bit more of a question mark. So here are some feedback from Abacus that some of you may have seen. Uh, pharmacists have the training and the skills to do stuff. 83% said, yes, it looks good. Do you support being involved in UTIs and birth control pills? Lots of green here. Bodes very well as far as acceptance uh, goes. Demand is a lot smaller. The blue here is for diarrhea and constipation and, and flus. Okay, they'll go to pharmacists for this as far as first stop. Whereas UTIs and birth controls, uh, birth control, it's still obviously uh, mainly physician or orange is, uh, I forget what that is, maybe uh, a hospital. So you get an idea of, okay, uh, demand and acceptance versus uh, what they might do is a little bit different. This really, confused me for quite a few years. I'd go by pharmacies in Saskatoon and I'd see big signs saying, we can prescribe, we, uh, come on in for this, this, and that. And I was wondering, I was not sure if pharmacist prescribing was an advertisable service. Does it look like we're trying to drum up demand inappropriately? And this was a lot of pushback from physicians were saying that, yeah, you're advertising for almost looks like, come on in, we'll, we'll help you out. So I, I struggled with that for, for years and I'm, I'm not sure if I've come to the right place yet, but I also feel that, well, how's the public gonna know what options they are unless we do, do some kind of public service announcement saying for various conditions, pharmacists could be on the list for that. So advertisable, wasn't sure. This sort of stuck a chord with me. How do I uh, rectify that? I'm not sure if I've come to any conclusion there. Pharmacist training. I understand the need for self-assessment of need. I do the same thing all the time. I think I support some required level of pharmacist training, if for no other reason than optics. That said, surely the needs are not could be topic specific or probably topic specific. For example, on fungal derm, my biggest need might be, uh, what's the differential? How am I making sure it's tinea and not something else? With allergies, when really the kick in with topical steroids versus antihistamines, with birth control, how best to pick a product to improve tolerability, and UTIs, I might just say, I need everything. So that's, that's tough to have a one-stop uh, shop to hit all those things. So uh, I, I, I think I see the need for mandatory, not for optics, but how to do that could be very tricky. And I'm a realist. Uh, I know what it's like to be a community pharmacist. How do you bolt on this stuff? Right now we're in the midst of uh, vaccinations for the flu and amongst COVID and all the other stuff that we, that we do this, uh, we do. This is tough stuff. Now, how do you convince pharmacists to do all that and now bolt on um, minor ailments. 
So just to give you some perspective, uh, in a, 2012, when we first started to about 2015, when I did this, the, the, put the feedback, there's how many prescribes that pharmacists were doing. One to 10 uh, was the vast majority. Now here's some pretty serious people down here, 100 uh, prescribes down here. But the vast majority were doing just low numbers as far as prescribes, perhaps based on it's busy out there. For perspective, there's that number we saw. That's just shy of 17,000 prescribes. And I wanted to give the context of how many OTC consults might have happened. So nothing to do with prescribing, I just got a bad cough, I got a bad rash. In 2018, my guess is about 600,000 OTC consults took place and about 17,000 prescribes. Not that they're connected anyway, but just for, for perspective, uh, we're busy out there. That gives you some ideas of the, the comparison. Finishing off here, the Saskatchewan guidelines are well respected. International, we're getting, uh, well, they're getting uh, calls from Israel all over the, the world uh, for access to these things. Don't reinvent them. These are tried and true. I would say tap into this somehow. And lastly, this may be the most important slide that I've got is how did this program fly as being one of the first ones in the province? Here's three people that were key. Ray Joubert as the registrar somehow straddled the line of convincing government, talking to pharmacists and physicians and getting all the flack all over the place there and somehow made it happen. So we have Ray to thank on that front. Karen Jensen as the MedSask person, Dell Access, Drug Information of Saskatchewan, hit it out of the park as far as developing those OTC prescribing guidelines. They could have easily flopped. Thanks to her, they were fantastic. And that was part of the, the process here of how this thing uh, made it through some pretty tough, uh, tough months. And lastly, Kevin Wilson was on the drug plan side and through his wisdom and other aspects, he decided to pay, he decided to pay pharmacists 18 bucks for this process. So those three, in addition to the good pharmacist of our province, somehow made this program work. And I don't think if we took any leg out here, I'm not sure if we would be successful talking about it today. Thank you. And I look forward to the panel chiming in for some, some thoughts. Thanks so much, Jeff. Thanks for your presentation. And I think um, that's a perfect segue into our panelists who are gonna touch on a number of the things that you mentioned in your presentation. Um, quick reminder, you can type in your questions to the chat box um, while we go through the panel discussion. Um, but just to get us started, um, I'm going to introduce Susan James. So Susan is the Director of Quality at the Ontario College of Pharmacists, and she is responsible for the strategic direction and alignment of the registrant competence hospital and community pharmacy practice and operations, as well as strategic pol policy, planning and analytics teams. Susan has worked in health professional regulation for over 20 years, following many years working as a healthcare clinician, administrator and lecturer. Thank you, Susan. Thanks very much. Um, so thank you so much for that um, discussion, Jeff, and uh, thank you to Saskatchewan and of course to all of the other provinces, as you said, Ontario is not the first in this. Um, and uh, we have benefited already as we're uh, still early in the process, but had great benefit from the experience and particularly from the work of Saskatchewan, um, some of your work, your uh, research that has informed us as we've been working through the regulatory process. Um, just very quickly, I will answer what probably is a question on everyone's mind. Where are we with this? Just to let you know that um, I'm sure most people have been following the process from the get-go where we were asked to uh, get started with regulations in May of 2019. And we did submit in uh, the end of June this year, our draft regulations for minor ailment prescribing that is with the government. The next step is a uh, posting of that regulation that is still required on the regulatory uh, registry with government, that's a 45 day post. And then once that's concluded and uh, they've been able to respond and consider any of the feedback that they might receive, um, it will proceed with final uh, drafting on the ministry side and then on for legislative approval. 
I don't have a date for you. Uh, it seems quite clear it's not going to happen in 2020. Uh, we do still remain hopeful that it will be early within 2021. Um, but are also very aware that with uh, COVID that the ministry has been busy with a number of other uh, regulatory initiatives and, and some of these things are definitely delayed. Uh, maybe just what I can do, a highlight a little bit of our process and, and touch on some of the things that Jeff has uh, said just very quickly, because I know that there's lots of questions we want to get to. This certainly is not, um, it's not as new as people might think in Ontario. In fact, it was back in 2019 when government first um, began that discussion uh, with the profession in terms of minor ailments. However, it didn't proceed at that time. And unfortunately there was uh, no further appetite until we received the letter back in uh, 2019. So we did certainly fall uh, far behind other provinces, but as you say, we have been able to draw on your experience. Um, even as we received the word to move ahead with this, however, I think it's important to note that government and, and perhaps all of the things that you've said, Jeff, um, are true in Ontario and we did receive from government um, a very clear indication that the intent was for us to move slow, uh, to start small, to assess and then to move forward with expansion. So uh, we are not jumping in in the deep end. Uh, we really are going with what is your advice? So that's good to hear. Uh, our approach and uh, knowing the landscape um, that we are and that all other provinces have been dealing with, particularly that of the um, medical profession, we knew that we needed to take um, definitely a systems approach. We needed to collaborate and, and uh, consult broadly. So people will know we uh, very intentionally had an advisory group that had uh, significant members of um, primary care and public health physicians. Uh, it did include pharmacists, um, some other health system experts, and we also had patient representatives. And um, that group was very critical to uh, assisting and advising as we were moving through the process. We also engaged heavily in consultations with the profession um, throughout. And uh, interesting that what you've shared is uh, very consistent with the kind of feedback, those ailments that people were uncomfortable with, wanted to um, um, go slow and be cautious, uh, very consistent with what we were seeing in Ontario. Um, I, I think just uh, knowing that we were uh, asked very clearly to start slowly, uh, indicate for people, I don't know how many know that really the government's policy direction on this was to focus on those ailments that would reduce hallway medicine and ease the burden in emergency departments and walk-in clinics. This was not about pharmacy moving into primary care provider role, um, even in places where um, access to that uh, service was going to be problematic. So uh, it really was already focused on um, some of those areas that, again, Jeff, you've noted uh, where there are opportunities for uh, improvement in that. Our list of uh, ailments, we started off open to consider any of the things that are available across the country, uh, about 31 different ailments right now that are, when you put them all together throughout Canada, um, are looking at the criteria from government. We reduced it very quickly down to 18 and, and then further down to 12, we did look at data, all of those uh, surveys, consultations that we did along with important data that we had from um, less urgent and non-urgent um, visits in uh, emergency uh, departments. So that led us to our 12. And I guess just as um, I wrap up really the consultation listed the kinds of concerns that you already have identified. It was uh, really about collaboration and communication with our primary uh, care providers the conflict of interest ethics in terms of dispensing and prescribing. Um, uh, we also had considerable feedback about the impact on the practice environment and, and concerns about the current environment as it is. Uh, and uh, in fact, in Ontario, um, there also was considerable concern about us shifting to drug categories rather than drug lists, something that we have been uh, looking to do for some time. And we had opportunity to do that with some other prescribers that were also moving to drug categories. And, uh, that continued to be a concern for others. So we have built in some uh, precautions, certainly uh, in addition to things built into the regulation. We are uh, looking at training. We are not proposing, we did not propose uh, mandated training on the clinical side, really just appreciating that this has been in the works um, and, and across the country for so long in Ontario. Uh, in preparation for this, uh, starting several years ago, there has been 
uh, considerable continuing education for individuals that is specific to some of the elements. Um, and in addition, we knew that this is something that's been built into curriculum. So not a sense that it needed to be in that place. Of course, an expectation that individuals will receive the education that they need and, and uh, ensure that they have the competency to engage in this activity before they do so. That it, onus is uh, like everything else on the professional to do that first. And then uh, we have focused on the regulatory uh, expectations, which of course will reinforce that expectation that an individual achieves the uh, knowledge base that they need before they would engage in any uh, new kind of practice. Um, we also have um, looked at the clinical tools that will be necessary and um, I, good to hear you say, don't reinvent, we are not going to reinvent. We recognize there are a variety of different tools out there. So the work that we are doing will be to um, assist, ensure that people do have a decision-making algorithm and then support with additional reference to other clinical guidelines, best practice tools that are out there. We are looking at um, assisting people with what is that first line best um, treatment uh, specifically for a couple of the minor ailments. There's been uh, definitely a public health focus on this from the antimicrobial stewardship side of things and those ailments that are going to include that, we are going to make sure that there are uh, some specific um, algorithm type uh, guidelines for individuals on those first line um, decisions treatment decisions. And then lastly, we are also committed to evaluation. So um, it's great to hear your experience around that. And we are also going to be building, uh, following a logic model, a whole evaluation so that we can hopefully demonstrate, um, like you, how we can move this and move to expansion. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks so much for those comments, Susan. Um, really valuable. Just in the name of time, I'm going to keep us moving along. So next we have Dr. Deborah Sebald, who is an associate professor in the teaching stream at the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy. And she's also a consultant in education and competence assessment and evaluation. She has extensive experience in medical education, including interprofessional health education and assessment, and a certificate in designing and assessing entrustable professional activities. Her subject matter expertise in self-care and minor ailments drives from over 28 years of teaching. So I'll hand it over to Deborah now. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be part of this in, in panel. And as Annalise uh, has said, I'm gonna be offering my perspective as an educator. How do we focus on the question of competence? How do we train pharmacists to be competent? and appropriately confident in this context of practice. So to begin with, I can confirm that all 12 of the minor ailment topics designated for pharmacists prescribing are included in our curriculum at the University of Toronto. Importantly, we know, as Jeff said, that the public trusts pharmacists to be available, accessible, and able to assist them in their therapeutic decisions surrounding their self-care of minor ailments. And they may actually go to internet sources of information before consulting a pharmacist. The most important thing in this context is to train our pharmacists to um, have confidence and competence in what we call three essential entrustable activities. And the first of these and the most important is an appropriate assessment of the patient's need for therapy um, based on an understanding of three things, uh, the disease elements, the drug therapy options, and confounding paper patient factors. So the first thing will be a judgment on the part of the pharmacist on whether or not to refer the patient to another healthcare professional, uh, on whether or not any treatment is needed, or whether it is within the scope of practice of a pharmacist to advise on self-care. The second uh, step would be to customize an appropriate plan for that patient. And that would be involving integration of non-drug measures, OTC measures, and now prescription measures, as well as discontinuing any products that the patient is taking or, or using that is are contraindicated. And then finally, pharmacists are um, 
it is important that they're able to educate the patient with respect to not just um, application or taking the product, but also on adherence and monitoring. And they have to do all of that in um, an environment in which they're using good communication techniques, they're establishing trust and credibility and a sense of rapport. So how do we train our pharmacists to do that before they graduate? Um, at U of T, we very much use the uh, concept of active learning. And my particular approach is see one, do one, teach one. So at the beginning of my first course with students, I send them out into a community pharmacy and they are there to observe an encounter between a pharmacist and a patient. And then they reflect on what they saw as a benchmark for practice or a barometer so that they can you know, analyze how they might learn to achieve that level uh, or exceed that level as they're learning. When we begin the topics, the students are required to learn foundational knowledge on their own. This teaches them the skill of critical appraisal of the, lit of the literature. And that's really important for maintenance of competency um, and self-regulation after licensure. And they are also taught a framework for assessment, care plan, and patient education. And then our classes, which are large, we have 240 students at least. And uh, in these days, the class is taught online and synchronously. So in those uh, classes, which I call skills labs, students are individually selected to have the opportunity to practice. And they practice with a situational judgment scenario, the idea of an emerging uh, case and they try to do an appropriate assessment, care plan, and patient education. And the other students can help and offer suggestions as well. Uh, at the end of the uh, session, uh, students are tested formatively and then summatively throughout the term in the same way. So they have little case-based quizzes in which they um, are given a story about a patient. They have to select out relevant information and then make appropriate decisions on the spot following the logic of clinical reasoning. And this helps them to learn to think on their feet, to recalibrate and uh, make good judgments. At the end of the course, the students then do another reflection. Uh, they think about how ready they are to practice independently and unsupervised in a self-care for minor ailments uh, environment, and also whether they would be willing and able to help other trainees. So, thank you. Thank you, Deborah, for that overview. Um, hopefully we'll have, we'll have room for quite a few questions, but I'm gonna introduce our final panelists for today, um, Dean Miller. So Dean has worked for over 30 years across both Canada and the US, and he has extensive experience in corporate and independent pharmacy. He's a staunch advocate for the profession. Dean has acted as the corporate representative on the Ontario Pharmacy Council, been the chair of the Ontario Pharmacists Association in 20, 2009, and was also the Ontario Chain Drug Association representative on the OPA Board of Directors. Dean's currently the president of Whole Health Pharmacy Partners, which is an independent um, banner of pharmacies uh, with mostly a presence in Ontario, but also across Canada. Um, thrilled to have you here today. Thanks for joining us, Dean. Thanks, Annalise. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thanks, uh, thanks everybody. I, you know, um, as I listened to Jeff, and Jeff, I think, really summed up sort of the operational considerations, and you know, that's why I'm on this panel is is really to kind of talk about some of those and how things, uh, you know, how, you know, 2021 might look when it comes to, you know, workflow and efficiency and that sort of thing. So, you know, obviously, you know, my uh, little banner of, uh, of pharmacies, uh, you know, we're looking at it pretty closely. Uh, Jeff, there was only one thing that I would say that I sort of didn't agree with you on is that uh, you said Ontario usually is, is first or leading but uh, you know what, oppositely, we usually look to Saskatchewan and other provinces and kind of go, wow, look at, look at all the great stuff they're doing there. So, so I, I am, uh, I, you know, I, I will say that I compliment you guys for, for being so proactive and, and, and great with this. Um, so, you know, there's always one thing that, 
you know, I've learned through my years in pharmacy, especially in the operations role is that, you know, whatever you, you know, whatever you do, whatever you want to roll out, um, you know, you have to take what you expect will happen and probably multiply it by about 10 and maybe more when it comes to um, how difficult it's going to be, you know, for a pharmacist to, 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 you know, embrace it and, and actually do something with it. And, um, you know, I, I looked, um, Susan, I looked on the OCP site as I, as uh, after Annalise asked me to be on here today, and I, I thought the comments sort of around enhanced scope of practice around minor ailments were really interesting because, you know, there was hundreds of them, first of all, and second of all, you know, there was really three th themes that I saw. One was, uh, you know, will I get trained? Uh, the second one was, will I get paid? And the third one, and it's probably the most interesting of the three, was, will my head office allow it? And, um, you know, it, it, it's not because there's any difference in the quality of those pharmacists, you know, whether they be in a corporate setting or whether they be in an independent setting. But, you know, I have learned, uh, you know, over the last couple of years of being involved with independent pharmacy, it's been super interesting because, you know, I thought a lot of the innovation, you know, always came out of the big corporate offices, but, you know, I was 100% wrong. I mean, there's some incredible things that happen at the level of independent pharmacy, you know, across this country. And I think, you know, once programs like this, you know, get introduced, you just have to kind of let some people kind of find their way and, and, and really sort of embrace uh, you know, embrace it and, and, you know, be creative and innovative them, themselves. Because surprising to me, you know, because, you know, I don't really consider pharmacy a very creative profession, but, you know, when it comes to challenges like this, you know, a lot of them pick up the ball and run with it and, and uh, you know, do some pretty interesting things with, um, you know, with an initiative. And, and I can kind of see, you know, minor ailments going exactly that way. I mean, uh, as Jeff said, I mean, this is all stuff we're doing already. Jeff, I, I guessed way higher than when you said 18,000 paid consultations. I thought when you said how many consultations did they, you know, would you think anybody does? Um, you know, I, I would have guessed a much higher number than that. And that's always, you know, that's, a, I think, a key component to this is that, um, you know, this is, these are all things that we're doing already. You know, I mean, uh, you know, pharmacists, certainly always get asked questions about all kinds of ailments, whether they be minor or, or, or chronic or, or, or something that, you know, impacts a family or a community. So, so really our job, I think, in some of the head offices are really to, to just kind of put a fancy bow on it and, and introduce it to, to pharmacists in a way that they're going to um, uh, embrace it and, and do something creative with it. Because, you know, there's, there's lots of stuff you know, out there. I mean, I, I think that, you know, one of the things that I've said in the independent pharmacy world, when pharmacists come to me and say, hey, you know what, Dean, I want to open up a, an independent pharmacy. What, what can I do? Um, and I said, well, what you shouldn't do is just put up four walls and open your doors and just expect patients are going to come running through the door because, you know, that is, uh, that's an old way. And, you know, there's a pharmacy on every corner now. Um, but you have to be creative. You have to do something with your pharmacy that's truly unique. And I think, you know, making, you know, a pharmacy, you know, even using the, a cornerstone of minor, minor ailments as, you know, something in your community that's indeed unique. And, you know, looking at the 12 ailments that we're considering uh, here in Ontario and seeing what you can do with those uh, you know, with your local physicians, with your local community leaders and, and doing something pretty creative and innovative with it, uh, I think is the key to the success. Um, uh, Zubin asked a really early question on the chat box that I looked at and it was really all around COVID-19. And I think, you know, what, what I'd like to say, you know, as, as probably my final comment here is that, you know, COVID has done a lot of positive as well. It's hard to sit here and say that, but, but you know, from a technology perspective, um, you know, and some kudos to uh, the University of Toronto. You've got a couple of brilliant students doing some very, very interesting things with technology out there that, 
you know, I've got four uh, independent pharmacies that are currently doing COVID-19 testing in the province, and all of them are using a piece of technology to help with appointment-based modeling and scheduling and, and, you know, different algorithms to, you know, assess patients. So, you know, I think, uh, Zubin, to answer your question quite simply, um, you know, the, the technology has been pushed along rather quickly over the last six months, and I think it's it's just what we needed in pharmacy to kind of get us, you know, get us moving on, on the use of technology and embracing change and, you know, utilizing technicians in different ways than we've had in the past. So, you know, it's been a bit of a, a you know, as we come out of COVID, I think we're going to be in a much better profession than we were uh, going into it because, you know, we've learned to be a little bit more creative and innovative um, and, and, you know, we're embracing doing different things in a different way. And that's, that's always a good thing. So, so at least those are my comments. Um, I'll throw it back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Jeff, um, Susan, Deborah, and Dean for each of your comments. This has been a great discussion. Um, just circling back to Zubin's question, um, Deborah and Susan was just wondering if you had any other thoughts to add on to what Dean has mentioned and Jeff as well, if you want to weigh in. Um, just to read it aloud for everyone in case people, people haven't seen it, uh, Zubin's question was, do you have any sense of how the pandemic has shifted physician and public attitude in terms of the need for or value of the pharmacist, sorry, value of pharmacist prescribing based on access to primary care during lockdowns? Will these shifts persist post COVID? So if anyone wants to weigh in further on that question, we still have a bit of time. Um, I, I think certainly, um, we are seeing that people are going to pharmacies. I mean, uh, you know, we don't have anything solid on that, but the feedback that we have certainly is that um, pharmacies are seeing individuals going there. So whether or not that's going to have a lasting impact, I don't know. It would be great if our minor ailments could roll out fairly quickly um, so that in fact, we could just keep that going. I, I think that if there's a gap, we have potential to lose ground on that front, but um, it, it might be helpful. Um, from the student perspective, I can say that many of our trainees are working in pharmacies now. And in fact, this week we had a session on cough and cold. And so a lot of the teaching and a lot of the questions from students uh, surrounded how do you differentiate symptoms of a cold uh, from a flu, uh, from COVID and they're seeing a lot of patients who are coming in and asking them in their role as trainees. Also, I spoke to a manager of my local pharmacy uh, who was a previous student and he's indicated to me that they are also doing COVID testing and that he's been called on quite a bit more to also give advice about COVID symptoms and seeking help and doing assessments, etc. So I think, I don't know if um, there's a shift in physician attitude, but definitely a shift in the public need and um, in the demand for pharmacists to have this information. And, and Lisa, I'll, I so hope Dean's right. <laughs> but that would be so nice. Uh, my thoughts are once the fog of COVID lifts, I think doctors will go back to being not so in love with us for prescribing. Uh, I saw the SMA uh, president a, a couple months ago in in a, in a grocery store and he actually got COVID. But he said, this is the slippery slope for a lot of doctors. They are very worried about this becoming the, the pathway into pharmacists doing a whole lot more that they're not really big fans of. So we might get some slack in maybe the COVID years, but I am, I am let's be positive, I'm hoping Dean's right. That's great. Is there any uh, anything you'd, you'd wrap up uh, with for us, Jeff, just in terms of what you think Ontario needs to do to really get implementation of minor ailments um, off to the right foot from the get-go? Any final words? Oh, that's, I never prepared for that question. Um, but uh, maybe a couple thoughts. I was um, talking to my friend, Nardine down in Waterloo, and I just told her the country needs Ontario to be successful on this front. So, hopefully all the, the, the stars will align and, and make it happen. The magic words for that, I, I don't know, but I would suggest this that I was planning on, on putting a slide into this and I, but I couldn't quite 
make it the right context. And, and no slight to myself or my, my academic colleagues, but be very careful coming across as too academic -y on this. This has to be grassroots, it has to be practical. It has to make pharmacists get pulled into the process. If we hit them with, again, I, I don't have a better term or a process than being too academic, that scares me. So not being able to define that, I think I might know it when I see it. That'd be a, a, a cautionary tale for me is uh, that aspect. Otherwise, boy, we sure want Ontario to make this happen. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Well, I'm sure you'll be staying tuned as as things uh, continue continue with this. Um, one more question. I think we have time for one more question before we wrap up for today. This is from Samu. It says Jeff, was minor ailments provided virtually in Saskatchewan during COVID, and are pharmacists part of the provincial telehealth services able to provide minor ailment support to patients via the telephone? It's a great question. Yeah, um, like I say, I haven't been in the pharmacy since March 1st. I thought we, to, and to be able to say I've done it, but I thought pharmacists were being involved in uh, virtual minor ailment consults to the degree of prescribing was taking place there. I don't know. Obviously, many of you will know that uh, northern areas of, of our province and your province, vir virtual uh, care is, is being more prevalent. Yeah, I wish I could, for Samuel, I wish I could be very specific and say, this is clearly happening and it's 10% of the process. I just don't know. Other than I'm pretty sure we're doing something along those lines. If not that, definitely appointment making is far more prevalent today than it was, where you just walk in and you just hope to find a pharmacist and they stop whatever they're doing and do their best to help with the minor ailment and then go back to filling prescriptions. Great. Okay, well, I think we'll wrap up for today, but I would like to extend a huge thank you um, to Jeff, Susan, Deborah, and Dean for joining us today. Um, fantastic, fantastic discussion, and I knew we'd have a lot of um, engagement from our audience on this. Um, few housekeeping items is that our next CPE session will be on December 3rd, so stay tuned for more information about that event. And then you can also stay tuned for an evaluation survey that we'll be sending around in our newsletter. Um, and that's really just to collect your feedback on, on how we can make sure that the CPE speaker series events are really meaningful and relevant um, to everyone who's tuning in. But most importantly, thank you again to everyone who, who joined us online today and I hope everyone stays well. Thank you so much.